Good morning. Just when you thought it was safe, I'm back. Yeah, we're continuing on with our series of Messianic Prophecies. Um, we're doing this as a build-up to Christmas. Christmas is obviously celebrating the coming of Jesus, so these prophecies were telling us about the coming of the Messiah. So when we uh, set out this series, there was about 40 or 50-some prophecies, and we put them into different categories so that whoever was speaking could look at the different categories. And uh, today I'm looking at ministries. The last two weeks, Pastor Tim, he looked at the lineage of Jesus, which was one kind of grouping of prophecies. And then um, last Sunday, Tim talked about the birth of Jesus and the prophecies concerning those. So that's kind of how we broke it up in uh, so we're going to continue on today, and I am going to be looking at some of the prophecies more or less related to Jesus' ministry, and uh, there's six of them, and I'm going to spend uh, most of my time on the last three, but just to give you an overview of where I'm going with these today, um, it's going to be uh, the pro- Messiah was supposed to bring a light to the area of Galilee, he was going to speak in parables, he was going to be praised by little children. He would be called a Nazarene. There was the prophecy of his triumphal entry, what we call his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then uh, the passage that uh, Brenda just read about the Messiah would preach the gospel to the poor. So as I set out to prepare this message, of, you know, there's different angles you could take. And one of the angles that I took was a question. And that is, could someone with a Messiah complex fake the fulfillment of of these prophecies today. Now, if someone was from the tribe of Judah and they were born in Bethlehem, could they think that they could fool the people around them by fulfilling some of these prophecies that took place during the life of the Messiah? So with that thought in mind, that's how I was going to dive into this today. So just in case you wonder where my little mind was going, that was where it is. So um, the Messiah, the first one, is to bring a, a light to the uh, area of Galilee, and on the map here, just for a refresher, is uh, most of the activity of the kingdom of Israel is down here in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and uh, the area of Galilee is up here, the Sea of Galilee. You can see uh, uh, Capernaum, Jesus did a lot of ministry there, and also the town of Nazareth, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But anyway, this is the, uh, the area that we were talking about, the fulfillment of the prophecy, uh, light to the Galilee. And uh, that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to read the passage that pertains that where it was fulfilled in the New Testament, which kind of encapsulates the, the Old Testament prophecy. And that slide didn't turn out very well. But And leaving Nazareth, uh, this is from Matthew chapter 4, Jesus came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Isaiah, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. Well, Jesus did live in that region, and he did ministry, did a lot of ministry, um, and he proclaimed that he was the light of the world, and he was sharing God's light. And the thing that someone you should ask, if someone is proclaiming to be a prophet or a prophet of God, is you should say, prove it to me. And Jesus, more or less, did it very um, powerfully. Um, Jesus proved himself by doing many miracles in that particular region. And these are just some of them, uh, a few of them. Uh, He turned the water into wine at Canaan, which is in the region of Galilee. Uh, He cast out the demons. You remember the story, the demons went into the swine, and the swine went down into the Sea of Galilee. That was done in that area. He also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He was a religious leader in the town of Capernaum. And then on two different occasions, Jesus performed a miracle of multiplying loaves and fishes and fed multitudes of thousands. So those are a few of the miracles that proved that Jesus was uh, who he was. Now, someone could say they were bringing a philosophical or a political light into the region, but to try to fulfill the prophecies, nobody could do it because Jesus did it. He proved it by his miracles. Now, another prophecy is the prophecy from Psalms that Jesus would, the Messiah would speak in parables. And we have here in Matthew chapter 13, there are several other passages, is that all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not, to speak, he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. 
I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Now, anybody could preach in parables. As a matter of fact, many of the rabbis during that time frame did. Many philosophers and traveling uh, speakers did use parables. So what was this so special about Jesus? Well, it's interesting. Uh, in all four Gospels, there's records of when Jesus explained that he would be speaking in parables, he also added in, he connected it with Isaiah chapter 6, and that is, while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. I don't know why Jesus did that, but he actually kind of raised the level of difficulty because he was combining the prophecy of speaking in parables with this issue of, of people not understanding. And I think the point is that uh, somebody who is a false prophet, they're not going to make a prediction that their prophecies are not going to be understood or their teaching is not going to be understood. And that's what Jesus was pointing out. Not everybody was going to understand or embrace what he was saying. Whereas somebody who was trying to fake these prophecies, they wouldn't more or less shoot themselves in the foot and say that their message was not going to be received. So the point is that people who are frauds are going to promote themselves, whereas people who are true followers of God are going to be humble. And we know that Jesus uh, demonstrated that humility throughout his, his ministry. Now, Messiah would be praised by the children. And this was uh, from was a prophecy that was mentioned in Psalms chapter 8. And here it was fulfilled in Matthew 21, which is part of Jesus' triumphal entry. And I'll, I'll come back to this point a little bit later. But it says, When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? Now, I can guarantee you if you had a bag of candy and walked down the hall and you gave candy to the children and the youth in the, in the children's ministry, they would sing your praises. You would be their favorite person. So, so anybody could make the children sing praises. But I think this particular passage has a little bit of irony in it. And notice that the, the, the children recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. They recognized that he was the king. The phrase, uh, son of David, that was an allusion to the fact that the, next, the Messiah, the king of Israel, the future king, was a descendant of David. So essentially the children were saying that the, Jesus was the king. And it was the religious leaders who were telling them to shut up. The religious leaders did not accept it. So a little point of irony there is that the children got the message and the religious leaders didn't. And I think that today in our age, we put so much emphasis on people's degrees and their experience. And, you know, you don't need to have an advanced degree to recognize the truth. And I think that was the simple point of this prophecy is that the children would recognize the truth. All right, those are the first three. The next three I thought were rather interesting, so I'll spend most of my time here. And the first one was that uh, Jesus would be called a Nazarene. And let's see if my clicker works. And uh, throughout Jesus' ministry, he was called uh, the uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And it reminded me of a story of a friend told me that someplace in the United States there was a town called Nazareth. Uh, and it had a little deli in it, and this deli specialized in selling cheeses, and uh, the name of this particular shop was called the Cheeses of Nazareth. All right, nobody got that joke. The Cheeses of Nazareth, the Jesus of Nazareth, all right. Oh, my. Lord, help us all. All right, this prophecy Matthew mentions in chapter 2, all right, and this is uh, early in Jesus' life, and it says that being warned in a dream, this is Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth, and this was to fulfill this, what was spoken through the prophets, so that he shall be called a Nazarene. 
Now, the interesting thing about this particular prophecy is that it is nowhere mentioned in the Old Testament. In fact, the town of Nazareth is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. So what's going on here? What do we do with this? Well, first of all, if you look at the, you probably can't tell the bolded letters. Matthew is telling us this was to fulfill the prophecy that was spoken through the prophets. In other words, this could have been just a verbal tradition that was passed down through the centuries, not just from one prophet, but from many prophets. And so that leaves us with a verbal prophecy. So obviously Matthew was aware, but Matthew was a Jew, and he was writing his gospel primarily to Jews who would have been familiar with this tradition as well. So the problem with this being a verbal tradition is that we don't have hard evidence to go back and say, well, did Jesus really fulfill this? But we do have some precedence for accepting a verbal tradition is that uh, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 20, Paul quoted Jesus as saying it is better to give than receive. If you look in the four Gospels, you will never see that phrase, it is better to give than receive. So again, there are verbal traditions that have been passed along. So we can accept that, but there may be some other explanations for this. And and one is that... uh, Uh, Nazareth was a synonym that was uh, associated with something that was contemptible or despised. If you remember when Jesus uh, uh, started his ministry, Philip was talking to a man named Nathaniel, said, hey, we found uh, the Messiah. And Nathaniel said, I'm sure you remember it, he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So evidently Nazareth had a very bad reputation. So if you connect the word despise with Nazareth, then that could go back to Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, which are classic prophecies about the Messiah. And the one from Isaiah simply says, it says, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of many of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we did not esteem him. And then in Psalm 22, which so eloquently de- depicts the crucifixion. It talks about, but I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by people. So there's the connection perhaps with the written uh, prophecy, but there also may be another explanation for what's going on with, um, and that is that Matthew uh, could be playing a a word association or a play on words. the Jewish word netzer, which means branch or shoot, um, a lot of times when the Hebrew, when the Jews wrote, they just used consonants. And the major consonants in the word netzer are NZR, and those are the same ones that would be in the word Nazarene. So by doing that, Matthew may have been connecting some prophecies to us. And a matter of fact, a lot of Jewish scholars. Um, connect uh, this particular prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene, they connect it with Isaiah 11.1, which says, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. So again, Nazarene, Netzer, and connecting the dots. So that's how that uh, comes together. Now, if you take a step back, like as I said earlier, Jesus said that, or Jesus was always referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. So if you're a Jew and you're looking for your Messiah and you're aware of the prophecies, there may be a little bit of confusion going on because, um, as Tim mentioned last week, is that the Messiah was born in Bethlehem and that was prophesied in Micah. Hosea tells us that the Messiah was going to come out of Egypt. And then way back in Genesis, I believe Jacob was blessing his children, he said that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. So how do we put all this together? Well, Bethlehem and Judah, are, Bethlehem was in the, the tribe of Judah, so that makes sense. But what, where does Egypt fit in, and where does Nazareth fit in? Because obviously Egypt's a different country, and then Nazareth was in the northern part of the country. It was not part of the territory of Judah. All right, let me tell you a story here. When the, when the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered by the Babylonians, the Babylonians deported many of the people from the southern kingdom over to Babylon. And they also captured the, uh, the king of Judah, which was uh, the, son of, the descendants of David or the predecessors of Jesus. And they all went to Babylon. 
Now in 850, excuse me, 583, let me get this right, 538 BC, uh, King Cyrus made a decree that the Jews were allowed to return back from Babylon and go back to Jerusalem and go back to that area. So this took place over the next four or five hundred years. Now, records have been found that indicates that there was a clan from the lineage of David, David's descendants or the kingly descendants, that when they went back to the promised land, they went back and they settled and they actually established the town of Nazareth at 100 B.C. And the reason they went there was that there was a non-Davidic king that had assumed the throne down in Judah. And they knew that they were not the legitimate kings. And so anybody who challenged that, they were going to be killed. So the reason why the descendants of David went and settled in Nazareth in the northern part of Israel was simply to save their lives. And this was about 100 B.C. Well, 100 years later, there's a different king in Judah. And about this time, the angel appeared to Mary in, in Nazareth and said, you're going to bear a son, um, Jesus. And then from there, Mary and Joseph went down to Bethlehem. They registered in the census. That's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Joseph had a dream. They said, get, you know, we got to get out of here and go down to Egypt. So they went down to Egypt. And then they had a, Joseph had another dream. Come back to Palestine. He was there. And he had another dream and made him move up to Nazareth. So if you're Joseph, you don't want to go to sleep at night because you have no idea what your dreams are going to tell you. But when you consider all this, it would be highly improbable that anybody could have replicated the movement of Jesus as depicted in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament scriptures. So the point for us is that you know, we need to keep an open mind about how God does things because this was certainly not a straightforward prophecy. And we also need to just keep an open mind about how we look at the scriptures. We can't pick and choose what scriptures to apply to our lives because the Jews at that time were looking for a political messiah, someone that would free them from the Roman Empire because there are prophecies in the Old Testament that talk about the messiah being the king and making Israel a predominant or preeminent nation of the world. And that's what the Jews were looking for. And that's going to happen one day but the Jews at the Jesus time ignored that, or they ignored the other prophecies. So what we need to do is learn from the Jews, is we need to take Scripture in its entirety when we study it and we, when we look at it. Because otherwise we could be leading ourselves uh, in a wrong direction. The next prophecy is the triumphal entry. And uh, this was prophesied in, by Zechariah about five or six hundred years prior to this. And uh, in Matthew's account of the triumphal entry, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now, anybody, again, somebody could try to fulfill this prophecy, but it's interesting that two times in New in the Gospels, it mentions that Jesus sat on an animal that no one else had ever sat on before. The significance of that is was nobody had broken that foal. They would have been thrown off of it. So the fact that Jesus sat on this uh, animal and subdued it, again, was proof that he was somebody, not just a mere man, but he was God. So another interesting point about this prophecy the triumphal entry um, has to do with the timing and also its connection to another prophecy. And if you remember last week, Pastor Tim talked about uh, the 69 weeks, the 70 weeks from Daniel. And a week that, he was, that they were talking about was a seven-year period. But let me uh, just read to refresh you the part of the passage. It says, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And it was very interesting, and I was, I was going to go into this, but if you take into account um, this prophecy... It was from the issuing of the rebuilding uh, 
of Jerusalem. That was in Nehemiah chapter 2. Remember when Nehemiah, the cupbearer, was talking with the king, and the king said, what's the matter? And Nehemiah said, Jerusalem's a mess. And the king said, okay, go and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, that was in the year 444 B.C. in the Jewish month of Nisan. Now, if you add these 69 weeks, which are 69 times 7, which is 483 Jewish years, and you convert that into our current years, you factor in leap years, and you also factor in that when you go on the, on the calendar from 1 B.C. to 1 A.D., there's no zero year. When you factor all that together from that month, Nisan, back in 444 B.C., the end of that 69 weeks is in the March-April time frame of 33 A.D., it's an absolutely amazing prophecy. But the thing I wanted to mention to you here is that not so much the timing, but what Jesus said. Now, prior to this, when during Jesus' ministry, when they want anytime anybody mentioned the king or him being the king, they would either ignore him, or he would either ignore them, or he would just run from them except in this particular issue, instance where when he was coming into the town, remember the children were calling him the son of David, they were recognizing him as king. And this is the first time that Jesus embraced or accepted the role as king because, because he said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And going back to this particular prophecy in Daniel where it says Messiah the prince it gets translated different ways. It could be Messiah, the anointed one, Messiah, the ruler, or Messiah, the king. So the prophecies fit together extremely well. And it's just an amazing time. And the point is that the Jews who had this written in black and white in front of them should have been counting the days. They should have been looking at the calendar. They should have been trying to see and anticipate the coming of their king, but they did not. However, Jesus was aware of the time. And there were at least four times I saw in the New Testament where he makes mention of this. And at the beginning of his ministry, he said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. In debating with the Jewish leaders, he said, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. And this one... At the end, this was during the triumphal entry, and Jesus was weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And a little bit later, he said, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Jesus knew what time it was. The Jews did not. So we need to be careful. Um, when we look at the Bible, it's very, very accurate. God has given us for a reason, not just to ignore, but to, or to read it and to embrace it. The Jews missed out on their time. The final part of today's uh, prophecy is about Jesus speaking, the, uh, preaching the gospel to the poor, which uh, Brenda just read. And uh, the prophecy that Jesus was fulfilling was in Isaiah uh, 61. And I'll just read that for you. So then he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now, preaching good news, anybody could preach good, a good story. Anybody could proclaim release to the captives or setting the oppressed free. I mean, we have people that preach the social gospel today. But when it comes to healing the blind, um, this is very specific and very unique. And when you look at all of the miracles that are performed in the Bible, Jesus is the only one who ever healed someone who was blind from birth. The only other time that someone who was healed that was blind and it was a special instance. Remember when the Apostle Paul encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road and he was blind for three days? And then God sent a man, Ananias, to him and then the scales fell off his eyes. 
But other than that, every recorded miracle of someone healing is only by Jesus in the Bible. So this makes um, this a very specific um, prophecy, and it just appears that the healing of the blind was a miracle that was reserved specifically for the Messiah. Now the background of Isaiah 61, according to Warren Wiersbe, refers to what's called the year of Jubilee, and that's recorded in Leviticus chapter 6. Now, what's the year of Jubilee? Well, the Jews were commanded to, uh, every seventh year they were to have a, a Sabbath year. And after seven of these Sabbath years, or after every 59 years, there was what was called the year of Jubilee. There was to be no sowing or reaping of crops. The land was to be returned to original owners as people bought and sold land. It was supposed to go back to the original owners. Anybody who was enslaved was set free. All debts were canceled. And everyone essentially was given a new beginning. So when Jesus came and he was proclaiming the favorable year of the Lord, what he was doing was proclaiming himself to be our jubilee. The symbolism is very powerful. Um, like the Israelites, they were not to sow or to reap, but to rely upon God's provision. We are to solely rely upon Jesus. We've been set free from the curse of death. We've been given new life. And he came to cancel the debt of sin that we all had with God. Jesus paid the debt that none of us could pay. And he made this way for us by his grace that only comes through faith in him. So in conclusion today, Jesus fulfilled these prophecies as a part of God's great plan for us. No one else could have done what Jesus did. And these prophecies were given to us to help us see the truth and to know the truth. They are recorded for us to test, to prove, to verify. They were also given to us to encourage us in our faith in God because I'm sure there's many times, like me, you have times where God seems distant and he's very silent. But I assure you that God has his fingerprints on everything. God's plans and future prophecies are still on course. There are many prophecies yet to be fulfilled, one of which is that Jesus is going to come back for his church. He's going to come back for us. But there's also... Other prophecies is going to dive deep, assembling the pieces and putting the puzzle together. And the world is going to dive deeply into a dark period that it has never seen before. But because of his word, we can trust in his truth and we can have hope that so many people don't have today. So the final thing I just want to mention to you today is, please take the time to read your Bibles. I know I always beat on that stump every time I'm up here. But please make yourself familiar with the prophecies that are yet to come. Let them remind you of the blessings that you have. Be thankful, especially this time of the year, what God has done for us, what he's prepared for us. Also, with these prophecies, be mindful that there are many people out there who don't know Jesus. They're your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers. And let that horrible thought of the tribulation period, let that, that's going to come, let that motivate you to stand up and tell others about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I give you thanks for your word. Lord, I confess that many times I read it, I personally.